You're welcome to Radio Aspile, something a little bit more light-hearted. Two boys from Darndale, Dublin, age 10 and 13, going an adventure. Enjoy. I'll see you next on the full episode of Radio Aspile. God bless. <laughs> Dublin, August 1985. Two Dubliners on the dart. This is the new suburban rail system. Just opened. It has changed their lives. They could now venture far afield from their home in Darndale, North Dublin. We used to always get on the dart and go out to Bray and go out to Dunleary and so these are all kind of new places so we just and then we realised that the, there was a boat the ferry that went from Dunleary to, over to England so that was an extended version of the adventure if you, if you like We went over a couple of times, like we used to do this kind of on a regular thing. We'd go over to Punk on the ferry over to England and then go from there, jump on a train or a coach or whatever, and go on an adventure. That's Keith Byrne talking about heading off with a couple of friends. But that's Keith Byrne now. In 1985, when he was getting the dart to Dunleary and sneaking on the ferry to England, Keith was 10. We'd gone to Pueli in um, the holiday camp like Butlins and Pontins and Blackpool, I think, as well. We, we went to it as well. So, Keith Byrne, age 10, and his friend Noel Murray, age 13, are sitting on the dart train into town. But the town they're heading for isn't Dublin. In fact, it isn't even in Ireland. Keith and Noel's final destination is so far away and the story of their epic journey there causes such a fuss that within a couple of days, these two boys sitting on a Dublin train in August 1985 will become front page news. This is Morning Ireland. It's a quarter past eight. The news headlines. Two Dublin boys... The news headlines. Two Dublin boys, aged 10 and 13, have been returned to Ireland after stowing... The boys, 13-year-old Noel Murray and 10-year-old Keith Byrne, are now back home. None the worse for their adventure... Welcome back. And first today, that amazing journey by two young stowaways from Dublin. Noel Murray and Keith Byrne... First Was there many people at the gate checking for tickets in that? Yeah, good for you. And did any of them stop you? Yeah, but we just says we were asked coming with the tickets. We were asked coming with the tickets. And they believe that? Yeah. The day of Keith's adventure began quietly enough. We were kind of just hanging around the, our local area, basically. We had Noel just knocked in for me into my house. My mum had asked me to go around and get some potatoes in the shop. I brought them back. My mum says, don't go far, your dinner's nearly ready or whatever. And I says, I won't, I was in the garden. And, and then we just says, let's go out to Dunleary and I kicked off from there. I was born and bred in Dublin, reared in Cabra, and then we moved to Drumcondra for a couple of months, and then we eventually moved out to Belcamp 26 years ago. Keith's school life was unsettled too. In 1985, at the time of this story, he was in St Joseph's Industrial School in Clonmel. I was basically trained and from school, not going to school and acting the agent and whatever else, so I was sent down there for me since. We were very, very streetwise for our age, you know, kind of like when we were living in Drunk Hundred, I was only around seven years of age, eight years of age, and my mum used to have to collect our money up in Cabra. 
because she, she had young kids, she couldn't make the journey. And I used to get on the bus. I was only seven, and I, I used to get on the bus, to get off the bus at Fisborough, and get on the Cabra bus up the Cabra, get off the bus up there, meet my nanny, go to the post office, collect the money, and make the journey back. And you know, I was like worried enough to do that at that age, and worried enough. I used to put the money in my sock, and you know, like I was like I would have been way ahead of other kids at that stage of the you know we are quite street wise you know we got off at Black Rock first we had got some haversacks and tracksuits and things like that we had shoplifted them in the shopping centre out there And then got off at Dunleary and then had tried to get on the, the ferry once, got stopped, and then we managed to get on to the next ferry. Weather well, conditions on route, they are improving all the time, although we do have a, a fresh westerly wind. Only slight season swell mid channel on the last crossing. Uh, if you could take a few more minutes of your time, please. And over to England then and then we just waited on the train then. The train went directly from Hollyhead to London. And we met some guy on the train who got chatting to him and told him we'd know where to stay for the night and and he, he says you can stay on, sleep on my floor for the night and I'll bring us back to the train station and you can do what his want from there the next day. That like London was a dangerous place in the night time and he didn't want to leave us on the streets kind of thing. We stayed in his house for the night and he drove us back to the train station the next morning. This is Hatton Cross. Please stand clear of Customers for Heathrow Terminal 4 should change across platform at this station for a train to Terminals 4 and 123. This is a Piccadilly Line service to Cockfosters. We had got on the tube, we had seen the sign Heathrow Airport, and we just got off there and went up the escalator stairs, and we were smack bang in the middle of Heathrow Airport. And we were kind of thinking, oh, we'll fly home. We'll see, can we get on a plane and fly home to Dublin? That was that was our idea at the time. So we kind of come up the escalator and we were smack bang in the middle of this huge place that was nothing like Dublin Airport at all. It was like ten times the size. We were just amazed. There was like a some kind of a fountain thing that you throw money in, like a wishing well thing, and we had taken some money out of that. Waves are really so simple, and that's what makes it good. In the airport, we had found these like lounge chair seats where you put a coin in and you can watch a TV screen. Monday, wrote Mr. Kipling, the form of my exceedingly delicious apple pie. We were sitting there for an hour or two, just putting money in the machine and sitting there watching the telly and, you know, but that was it. We were just having fun, basically. At one point in the airport, Keith and Noel were spotted by security. The officer thought it was suspicious that two boys, aged 10 and 13 years old, were wandering around the terminal, seemingly alone. It was then the boys came out with a response that was to carry them on much further in their journey. 
we just says, oh, my mum's coming with the tickets now and the bags and things. So she just says, OK, just wait for your parents. So we just walked and stopped for a minute and when she wasn't watching, we just kind of legged it off so she didn't see us, like, kind of thing. The same trick got them through the main airport security and into the shopping area. We walked on through, like we just had a little a little carry bag with us, a plastic bag with a few sweets and things like that in it. That was it basically. They just let us walk through kind of thing when we told them our parents was coming with the tickets. For the two boys, this wasn't so much duty free as plain old free. We were walking around all the shops and we were fascinated by all the stuff, like, and, like, how easy it was, like, to just pick things up and, like, take things up, basically, you know. We got another little rough sack thing and we started taking bits of jewellery, like, chains and bracelets. We took Philly Shave and other other kind of little nicky nacky items and things like that, and... Then, like, when we were kind of bored at the shop's part, we kind of start walking in the direction where all the people were walking. And there was there was these flat escalators that move along the ground. And I remember we got on one of them and we just asked the person, the man, where where is this plane going? And he says, New York. And we kind of just looked at each other and says, yeah, we'll go. Finally, they got to the boarding gate and the airline staff checking boarding passes. This would be the end of their adventure. Surely the line about parents lagging behind wouldn't work again. They asked the same question, like, you know, who he is with or whatever, and we just says, oh, their mum's coming, she has the boarding passes, like, and mum and dad is coming, they have the boarding passes. So they just says, OK, go on. They were obviously just busy and they just slipped their mind and we just walked on down the plane and just sat on two seats and the person come down and says, oh, there are seats. So we just got up and moved back two sets of seats and sat down and the plane was only half full, so no one came near us. There was a, like, there was, I can remember there was a lot, 20, 30 seats around us that was empty. So like we were kind of, would have been a, like a jumbo jet kind of, like they, they hold a lot of people. So there was a lot of seats that were empty. There may have been a good reason a lot of seats were empty. The plane the two boys had wandered onto was an Air India jumbo jet. Two months previously, almost to the day, an Air India jet had blown up off the southwest of Ireland. 329 people had perished. Uh, shortly after 8 o'clock this morning, Air India, like 182, uh, contacted Shannon in the normal way on uh, reaching the Shannon boundary. It was cleared to London at flight level 310, 31,000 feet. But five, six minutes later, the uh, radar controller observed that the aircraft was no longer on the radar screen. And every effort at that stage to establish communications with it uh, were unsuccessful. Uh, two aircraft in the vicinity were called, contacted, and they could neither establish uh, communication with it or indeed any visual contact. And a full-scale search and rescue mission was uh, organized at that particular stage. Once the Boeing disappeared off the screen, emergency procedures were put into action. The operation was coordinated from the Marine Rescue Center at Shannon. The wreckage was found off the Kerry coast in exactly the spot where the plane had disappeared off the radar screen. Before we knew it, like, the doors closed on the plane and it was ready to take off. The overhead units, in case falling cabin pressure, individual oxygen mask will drop automatically. Cover your nose and mouth with the mask and breathe normally. We couldn't believe like that. No one had actually copped on to like what we were doing, or like these these two kids are sitting on their own, and like who's with them, or anything like that. Like. Um, I 
wasn't actually till the plane had taken off and was in the air when they were going around with the mouths. The air hostess came up to us again and we remember sitting on our own and says, uh, would we like something to eat and where was our parents? And we just says that they were up on the front of the plane and they gave us a curry, called it an Indian curry, which I can remember was too hot for me, so I didn't take it. I didn't eat it. I just ate the bap that was with it and some water. We were watching the James Bond film on the TV screen. Have security keep a good eye on him. Hmm. Oh, by the way, you didn't say what part of the state you come from, Miss... Uh... No, I didn't. So we were sitting there, just they kind of bit into that, watching that. And we were kind of bored, so we were just walking around the plane and going back to our seats. And Noel had fallen asleep, and I was just rambling and up and down. And then I came back down, and I fell asleep. And then we kind of just landed then in in America. When the plane landed at John F. Kennedy Airport and taxied over to where you got off the plane, the doors opened and everyone just started getting off and we kind of just milled in with the crowd getting off the plane. Union Fair representative, please receive the information copter located near Iowa's Hall. There was like a kind of a security thing there again where they look for your passport and things like that. They stopped us and they kind of asked, you know, where's your passport, where's your papers and things like that and we just told them the same thing like oh yeah my, uh, ma'am's because we were kind of pretty much at this stage up near the front of the people so we just says oh yeah we pointed kind of in a backwards direction oh yeah my, ma'am's coming with the papers now and kind of when they weren't looking and they were dealing with other people we were kind of like just ducked under the they were kind of in like little security boxes with glass on them and they had kind of wood kind of half a up if you, if you like about three feet up and we kind of just ducked down and ducked under and went. And once we got past them, like we were out into the, you know, the center of the airport. We had kind of looking around, just walking around the airport. It was so big, huge. We were fascinated by everything, all the different people. Like, cause like at this stage in Ireland, there wasn't that many black people or different like nationalities and that and, and like in the middle of John F. Kennedy Airport in 1985 you have all different kind of people so we were just totally fascinated and everyone was so tall and you know everything is just bigger and so we were walking around the airport for nearly two three hours just, just looking at everything and fascinated by everything before we even ventured outside the airport. They had them um, telly things and the seat things again. Glenda Prentice, come on now! You're the next contestant on the price, is right! He's sitting there and looking at them for about an hour. Glenda! We had the backpack with the stuff that we had stolen in uh, Heathrow and things like that. And we were wondering, like, well, if we sell this, who who can we sell this to, to get some money or whatever? The actual retail price is $1,570, Kathleen, you win. We kind of had decided, like, we'll go into the town, as we as we called it, like, because over here it's called, like, town. You go into town, you go into Dublin City Centre. But we weren't thinking, like, this big New York City. We, we weren't thinking on that scale. So now, you have two Irish schoolboys in the middle of JFK Airport, one age 10, one age 13.
Keith was supposed to go in for his dinner in Darndale on a Thursday afternoon. Instead, he and Noel bunked off on the dart. They stayed on as far as Dunleary Ferryport. They sneaked onto a ferry bound for England. Got a train to London. Got the tube to Heathrow Airport. And blagged their way onto a New York-bound jumbo jet. All this they did with a bit of boyish charm, cunning and the odd few words. They were ready to take on Manhattan, but it was not to be, for it was the few words that would let them down. We had seen this person in, in a uniform who we thought was a security guard, and so we walked we walked up to him and anyway, not realising that he was a policeman, and asked him, like, hey, mister, how do you get into town? And he kind of looked at us a bit strange, and he kind of says, who are you guys with? And, we just says, uh, well, we're our mum and dad, you know, and he says, where is your parents? And at that stage, I think it dawned on us that, like, oh, shit, like, what we had to do, and, like, we kind of got afraid then, like, we're after being travelling on a plane for so many hours, we're, we're, like, thousands of miles away from home, and we kind of just said to him, look, at, we're not with anyone, we're on our own, and he says, we're at the bonking on the plane, and he didn't understand what we, what we were meaning. He, he just says, hang on, guys, for a minute. And he got on his radio, his walkie-talkie. And a police car just pulled up then. And he put us in the back and brought us to, the, I think it was the 15th precinct or something like that. brought us there and we were kind of celebrities uh, you know when we got there it was kind of look at these two guys like they're with no one and they they says that they they're at the stowaway and on a plane and that's when we first heard the word stowaway because we had never heard of that word before or anything we were with the guards so we kind of knew we were safe if you know what i mean and that they'd kind of organized some way of getting us home like although Nobody had said that to us or anything like that. They had just kind of asked us questions of what we had done and how we had done it and things like that. And we just decided among, amongst the two of us that we'll tell the truth and we'll tell them everything because like, we just wanted to go home as quickly as possible at this stage. The fact that Keith and Noel decided to fess up and cooperate didn't mean they still weren't going to have fun. They had us in a room and... In a, we're, we're a desk and there was a police officer sitting where he was asking us questions and every so every couple of minutes there was detectives coming in and you know sitting down and laughing and joking with us and like at one particular one detective came in and he had a gun on the side of him and I was fascinated by this and I, I asked him you know is that a gun you have and he says yeah and I says can I hold it you know and he says yeah and he took out this big thing like that's wooden well brown brown wooden handle and then steel and I had the 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 barrel on a thing. Well he took he had actually he had actually took the bullet out onto his hand first and then clipped the the barrel back up and handed it to me then and my hand kinda of jerked it in a downwards motion, you know, like with the weight of it. And I was kinda of holding it and pointing it around and I pointed it at my friend all and went bang, you know, like that and messing and pointed it at them and he just took it back off me and started laughing and saying, You guys are crazy and all like saying to us like, you know. The stowaway boys arrival at the police station was entertaining until they said what airline they had arrived on. When we told them the airline that we had come on was an Air India plane, this is a like a security issue, like because one of their planes had been blown up out of the sky or whatever, like that. So like they were literally like going mad, you know. They decided that they wanted to investigate this like 
properly and see how we had done it because it was getting a bit serious at that stage like the kind of the laughing had stopped and it was more of a kind of security reason and like Jesus how did how are these guys have to do this and you know what I mean like it was kind of they were thinking more on the lines of terrorists and things like that like you guys could have having bombs or anything which is and you've done this like this is very important that you show us how you've done this and how you've managed to get through this Put us in a hotel in a penthouse suite with um, five security guards overnight and get us BLTs and chips and everything. Fed us like lords, like we loved it. At first they had us handcuffed to the bed and like we kind of, I kept slipping my hand out of the handcuffs because I had only tiny little hands and they were getting annoyed by that so they ended up just taking the handcuffs off us and just letting us sit on the beds and whatever. They wouldn't let us go outside the room, they let us watch any telly we wanted. still had the bits of jewellery and the things of that and we had been thinking like because we had no money what we were going to do with this when we were in the police precinct we had asked a few of the detectives and that who had as I said shown us the gun and that what their money had looked like now we kind of knew what dollars looked like but we were kind of being cute and like kind of playing dumb and whatever and when they were taking out like a dollar or ten dollars and showing us that we were looking at it like saying oh Jesus look at that can I have that and all and a few of them had given us no yeah yeah go on like and we had like about 70 or 80 dollars at the time and we just as we kind of got talking to the security detail I took some of the jewellery out of the little haversack thing that we had and I was looking at it and they were looking they were looking at it and saying where did you guys get that and all and we asked them, did they want to buy it? And like some, of, they bought some for of offers, you know. And we asked, like, like who was it for? And they said they were going to give it to the hookers over there. But they t told us in detail, like prostitutes or whatever. Like we were, <laughs> well, here we didn't care. We were just getting, we were selling it. They were giving us money, and so we hadn't a penny going over. And like coming home, like we we two or three hundred dollars. The boys may have been living like lords, but back in Ireland. The boy's parents were frantic. My mum, she got a knock on the door and she had reported me missing, obviously, like, and because um, we were gone at this stage, we were gone for three or four days and it was quite serious, like, she was totally worried, sick and that. But she told us that she just got a knock on the door, like, in the evening and it was a policeman from Kulak and he says, Miss Bourne, yes, you have a son, Keith Bourne, yeah. Well, we found him and she says, oh, that's great and... He says, we found him in JFK airport. And my mum says, oh, great, the airport. He's only in the airport. And she says, what airport? JFK airport? Where, where is that? And he says, America. And she says, what? America? What the hell is King doing in America? Joe! Dynasty. Joe! The following day, they kind of woke us up, gave us some breakfast and that. This week on Good Morning America. Five on Channel 30. And um, brought us to the airport. When we got to the airport, they kind of had some part of a shutdown kind of thing. And they brought us right up to where the plane had come in and we showed them which corridor because we remembered which corridor we had come through and come down and showed them like like we got off the plane here and we walked down here and we told them when we got to the immigration kind of thing how we got through that and like what we what we had told the immigration guy and ducked under the thing like and like he was busy it wasn't his kind of fault you know like because we knew he'd kind of probably get into trouble or something like that you know so like we showed him every way that we went and everything and then told him we were in the airport for two or three hours later after that they brought us back to the hotel and there was reporters trying to get up to the room to see us and things like that 
They actually kept us in New York for about two days. We went back later on that evening and we had to go back over what we had told them earlier on that day, go through the whole thing again and, you know, because the airport was so big and we had to show them every way, they wanted to get everything right down to detail and we showed them all that and then, like, we were told them we were going home then the next day. The security guys, two of them, brought us out in a car. Brought us to the Empire State Building and bought us a monument, little tourist kind of thing, if you like, of the little square piece of marble with the Empire State Building on it. We had flags with I Love New York on it. Banners, I Love New York, things. They bought us things like that and all and gave us that. They brought us back to the airport. Have your attention all our passengers. At this time, we'd like to welcome all remaining passengers to board. We were on an Aer Lingus plane, we were safe, you know. We, we knew then we, we were going home. We were going to meet our parents. This is Morning Ireland. It's a quarter past eight. The news headlines. Two Dublin boys who stowed away on an Air India flight from London to New York are due back home shortly. Gander, Shamrock 1-1. Flight level 330. Estimating overhead... Despite feeling safe and looking forward to meeting their parents, Keith and Noel decided they'd played along with the authorities for long enough. So we were kind of thinking then, oh, my mum's going to kill me and my dad's going to kill me and we were thinking, jeez, what are we going to say? And, you know, like, what's going to happen? Like, who's going to be there when we get off the plane? And because we were so worried, like, what's mum and dad going to do? We're going to get killed. Like, Jesus, look what we're at to doing. We says, like, we kind of found out on the plane that we stopped off at Shannon on the way. When we heard that, we kind of, we says, right, we'll, we'll jump off at Shannon and then, like, we'll make our way home. Nobody will know, and then we'll just make our way home quietly, and, you know, everyone will forget about it, and we'll just go home, and, you know, everything will be all right, you know? And I don't know, but I think they drugged us or something on the plane, because we, we got a drink about a half an hour before we arrived in Shannon, and it just totally knocked the two of us out. The two of us fell asleep. News headlines, two Dublin boys who stowed away on an Air India flight from London to New York have arrived home. And when we woke up, like, the police were standing beside us, everyone else had gone off the plane, and, like, we had to come down the stairs and walk across the runway, and they brought us into the security area, and Kulak Gardi were waiting there for us, and they took, they took control of us then. And the details now from Anne Doyle. Two Dublin boys who stowed away on an Air India flight from London to New York at the weekend are now back home, none the worse for their adventure and a little richer. The boys, 13-year-old Noel Murray and 10-year-old Keith Byrne, are both from the Dublin suburb of Darndale. They were discovered by New York police on Saturday standing on a pavement near the airport terminal. They first told police they had lost their tickets and their mothers had their passports. But the police contacted Garvey in Dublin and found they had been missing from home for several days. Earlier last week... There was a, a guard from Kulak who, quite, who knew us quite well. We used to pump him through like a lot of butter kind of thing, you know. And he was there and when he seen us, he says, you know what, you're two feckers, you know. He says, what, is, what have you got up to now? And he kind of grabbed us and took... And there was another guard with him and they just turned us into the back of a squad car. New York police had given them money with which they bought souvenirs for their families and still had a few cents left over. It was all photographers and all snapping photographs and everything else and we were kind of waving out the window and rolled down the window and out with the flags and he was like, get them windows up and you know, don't be away, who just think is hard and all celebrities and you know all this and we were just having grey crack, you know, like. Our reporter Pori Kira was there and spoke to a somewhat subdued young Keith Byrne and to his parents. 
The boys' first attempt to get to Britain on the Hollyhead ferry last Thursday failed and they were sent back to Dublin then. But, as Keith explains, they were not to be put off. We went back on the boat to uh, Hollyhead again. They got to try the London, the plane to New York. Was it hard to get out to the airport in London? No. How did you do that? By train and bus. Did you have tickets? We pay on the bus, but not on the train. So when you got to the airport, did you know what you wanted to do? No, not really. And why did you pick on New York? Did you want to go to New York? No, I just asked the man where was the plane going. It says New York, so we just got on the plane. Was there many people at the gate checking for tickets and that? Yeah, good few. And did any of them stop you? Yeah, but we just says we was coming with the tickets. We was coming with the tickets. And they believed that? Yeah. So when you got on the plane then, did somebody ask you for a ticket there? No. And was it a long journey or did you enjoy it? Yeah. And were you hungry? Did you get anything to eat? Yeah. They, they were saying me things on the plane. And did you eat them? No. What, what, what did they give you? Uh, curry stuff. Curry and rice. So when you got to New York then, did you walk off the plane with the other people? Yeah. And what were you hoping to do? Did you want to get into bus into town? My friend did. Did we ask the policeman where, what, what, what way is it into town? And he just asked us what was her name. We got tickets for being over there. And he just, let me said no, he brought us off to the police station. My mum just and dad just turned their arms around me like I was I was expecting to be get killed, you know, but my mum was just there were floods of tears and my dad was they were just like so happy to see us. I don't think I could have done any more than putting him down there, letting him home on the holidays. He was told not to move out, his dinner was on, a half one on Thursday, and when I looked out again Keith was gone. They apparently had tried to get out of Ireland twice last week. Are you afraid that they, they might do this again? Yes. That's all I was worried that once they had tight security on them this morning when he got to Dublin. Did they ring you from England or did they contact you? No, America did. Sergeant Harrison, he was terrible nice. He asked me did I love him, did I want him home and when I last seen him and I told him since Thursday. Well, I think they might have been expecting that he would be caught. Where it's just when they weren't caught. Lieutenant Richard Richards of the New York Port Authority Police at JFK Airport has been telling us about the two boys' journey. One of the things that they wanted to see was some of the sights here in New York. Um, the Statue of Liberty, the Empire State Building was one that they mentioned, and we also have some tall towers down at the foot of Manhattan Island here. Um, the World Trade Center. So they had an itinerary planned out? Well, yeah, I think that they uh, kind of were an adventuresome uh, twosome, and they were certainly um, uh, prepared for uh, their, uh, their itinerary and their journey. You think they might try it again? I don't know. I wouldn't say try it again. No, I think he's... Um learned his lesson. Well, hopefully he has this one. But for now, he's home to stay. He's home, thank God. That's all I want. Well, do you find it amazing that uh, they managed to make it all the way to Kennedy? Well, they're quite enterprising young people. Um, they appear uh, in the American vernacular to be what we consider streetwise. I think that it, perhaps if they continue this, they uh, someday will be the head of some large corporation. Keith or Noel didn't become CEOs. Me and Noel split up around 16. I just kind of stayed with my mates and he went on and done whatever he was doing, you know. But for Keith, he did just as well as anyone during the boom time before losing his job in the building trade. Keith's a family man, loves his kids, and it's clear he and his partner plan to raise them right. When they're out playing in the garden, he keeps a close eye on them and they always come in for their dinner. I don't think there'd be any chance that you'd get away with it now, nowadays with 
everything that's going on with the planes and the, the security that they have nowadays, you know, like, there'd be no way you'd get away with it now, or, you know, they wouldn't fall for that old trick, or my mum's coming behind me, you know, like, they'd be, they'd be too worried for that, you know, like. Nowadays, I don't talk about it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring it up in conversation, but, like, if it's brought up in conversation or whatever, like, I'll talk a little bit about it, kind of, you know. It's it's a happy, like, experience or a happy memory, you know. Like, it's not a sad memory or anything, like, you know. I still haven't lost that adventurous nature, you know. Like, I love travelling different places and me and my partner would go, go off and on drives, we'd drive down to Kilkenny and Carlow still and the week and things like that, you know. I'd bring the kids off and walk around.